Sounds good. Well, hi, Kyle Borland. It's so good to see you again. We first met at um, the Bay City Beacon several years ago when I was, when we were both writing for them in San Francisco. You covered cannabis mostly, I covered housing mostly. Um, and since then, you've started the Third Cultured uh, blog, I believe, a uh, newsletter. Um, is that hosted on Substack? Yeah, still, still oh. on Substack. <laughs> Fellow Substacker, love it, love to see it. Um, so yeah, we are both uh, queer kids from Alabama uh, who uh, left the South and uh, in my case came back. And um, I'm super excited to catch up with you and get your perspective on um, this question of US native born men and what's wrong with them and what's facing them. and. I think, you know, as an out gay man who grew up in an environment where that was, um, you know, another thing that we have in common is growing up in evangelical Christian uh, environments. Um, yeah, I'd just love to know, like, kind of your perspective on the topics I've been writing about as far as polarization, atomization, men um, opting out of education, employment and training, um, declining marriage rates, declining fertility rates, like all that mess of problems. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in essence, you know, what can the queer perspective, uh, what light can the queer perspective shed on on these phenomena? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thank you for having me. I'm super excited uh, to be having this conversation with you. Um, when you started kind of like the series of really like analyzing uh, like what the hell's going on with American men, uh, my partner and I talk about it all the time, excuse me, all the time where uh we're constantly, uh, whenever, whether we're watching reality TV, talking to our friends, reading what uh, women and talk, like straight women, bi women, uh, women that have to engage uh, with cishet men, uh, just reading the things that they have to deal with, the conversations that they have to have, um, really wondering like what the hell is going on, like why, uh, what where did the di like where did the split happen because we had earlier this year a study come out that showed that like if all the gay men and bi men in America were our own country we would be the most educated country in the world I think it's like 52 percent of us uh, have a bachelor's degree uh, we're 50 like 50 percent more likely to have a professional degree so a PhD a JD or an MD than a straight man um and just like, why did that happen? Uh, I know for me personally, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with most of my friends, if not 90%, all of my really close friends growing up were smart girls, were uh, just want girls who either like, they knew I was gay, they didn't care, or they were just like, I don't know what that is. It's not on my radar. I'm focused on school. Um, and those were just the people that I gravitated towards. And so um really I was just playing catch up with them I wasn't even like competing with any of my friends most of the time um I think my friend group uh when I graduated from Prattville um uh, and I had moved there sophomore year of high school so it was really like wherever I gravitated towards let's like try and uh make it work um uh, like one of them was the valedictorian four of them were the salutatorian because we had eight of them I, I don't know uh, and so I was just like really trying to keep up with my friends and uh, school was really important. I remember ironically, like looking back on it, it seems so silly, but I just really needed to get an ACT score that had a three at the beginning of it because all my friends are getting 32s and hires. And I was like, fuck, I need to get to a 30. Uh, I ended up, uh, I think I, start, I went like 24 the first time and I was like, oh God. I don't even want to tell them this. I don't even want to like- I'm going to get like, kicked oh. out of the group. <laughs> okay, exactly. Like I'm making the group look bad. Uh, and so I think a lot of it has to go back to just uh, what were the expectations? Obviously as queer men, we have the uh, best little boy in the world syndrome. Um, and so that's, I, I don't know if you've ever read the, um, the Velvet Rage, but it's generally the idea is like, because uh, gay men or just like non-mask, presenting men it doesn't even have to be a gay or a bi man just like uh, my dad is a straight man but growing up just wasn't uh what the northeast like he was from south boston deemed like masculine and so he dealt with a lot ironically a lot of the same things that i did and so it's really not just isolated to like men who have sex with men men are into men it's really just like if you deviate at all 
in a masculine world and especially when like being a little boy is just masculinity test after masculinity test after masculinity test if you fail those more often than not you kind of have to overcompensate somewhere else and so queer men definitely overwhelmingly uh gravitate towards academics we know like we know we can sell there we know we can we, we know we can like own it at this point and uh and then just never really let go whereas like I guess at this point straight men are kind of trapped in that uh they don't want to be seen as like and they don't want to be Nancy Drew like that traditional femininity school and now they don't want to be seen as like oh if I'm trying too hard are they gonna think I'm gay which is crazy but like you know being a, being a teenage boy, being a boy, being a man is kind of crazy. Uh, and so they kind of lock themselves into like sports and video games. And then if they aren't good at sports, that only leaves video games, which like now we have like esports, but it's kind of the same thing as sports. Like if you don't have the skills, you're just wasting time. And so I think it's just like a uh, like a, I was about to mix so many different words, like an amalgamation of uh, one, not taking, I think the main thing is the men aren't taking responsibility for like the choices that they made and what got them to a point where like they have less choices as an adult, but also just the cultural forces that kind of made them feel that way in general. And I think I know that's why I liked what your series was about so much was because we do need to kind of like re like pivot the conversation from like, why are they so horrible to like, what can they be now? What can we provide them? Because they are being left, like they are being left behind and they are struggling a lot and just kind of trying to find that balance of like, how do, how do we support men? How do, especially like support straight men without coddling them? I guess. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And, and that's kind of my, that's a, a great way to put it is that one of the things that I've loved about engaging more with left leaning analysis is that it focuses more on, I feel like to vastly oversimplify, the right is very much about good people versus bad people and agency and choices. And the left is much more about incentives, systems, um, you know, assuming everybody is good, everybody wants, you know, similar things, but uh, systems and structures and incentives make it more difficult for some people to have the same outcomes as other people. And so it's like, okay, how do we take this, you know, beautiful, I think, lens and apply it to the some of the people that maybe the left isn't as interested in uh, being sympathetic towards, uh, not because they're more deserving. Um, and, and that's never where I want it to come from. Is that like, you know, white men are, are um, you know, more deserving of help than other groups, but just because like we all need help. And this is an area where I think the consequences of ignoring their problems are gonna be really bad for everybody. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, that's kind of my perspective. And I'm, I'm glad that we're on the same page about that. And I wanted to dig into, you know, there are several things that I appreciate about right-wing analysis. Um, one is the focus on um, things like um, family, social structures, um, uh, communities that are geographically uh, near each other. Um, I think these things are important. Um, but another is I do hear people on the right who are concerned about what's happening with men talk about the quote unquote feminization of school and work. And I think, you know, what you're saying is that, um, there's something contradictory between masculinity as it's currently conceived. And I think we also, I want to take a second to, um, acknowledge that I do believe that, masculinity is policed much more aggressively than femininity. Um, and so, you know, I think it's much easier for a, a, a girl growing up, wherever she's growing up, to choose between sports and academics. And um, obviously, the, you know, women are disincentivized from pursuing certain uh, academic paths. But um, but it is, I think, more socially acceptable for her to get outside of femininity than it is for a boy to get outside of masculinity. And 
So I'd love to hear your perspective on whether and to what extent the reason that boys see academic achievement as unmasculine is because of um, the, uh, is, is due to, uh, you know, education, uh, let's just focus on K through 12, being hostile to masculinity. Do you think there's anything to that? Um, I think to an extent, yes, because uh, ironically, so with uh, gay men and straight versus straight men across the board, across races, across uh, income, we succeed more. It's not like a white man, like white gays versus everybody else. Like it's just queer men are succeeding more than straight men. That does not hold true. And ironically, I, the whole thing flips when you go to women because lesbians um, are tr traditionally had more like degrees were succeeding more than women just because um, the things that were holding women back in the 60s when they were finally like given access. And so that gap has closed a lot. Like with younger women, it's basically on par with each other between straight and uh, gay women. But ironic or unfortunately is probably the better word unfortunately that across all demographics doesn't hold uh so like white lesbians can like keep up with their counterparts but every other racial group they start succeeding less by like a substantial significant amount um and a lot of them to... sorry just interrupt and it's my understanding that bisexual women um, are also at disadvantages in a lot of areas, um, more likely to be victims of violence, domestic violence, more likely to have lower incomes. Mm. Um, so I'm guessing that bisexual women would also have like less academic achievement on average than straight women, but I don't know. Yeah, I was, I don't, I, they say queer women in the study I was reading. So I'm just, I assume just like anyone read as queer, kind of like deviating from that, um, that like Nancy Drew, good girl, academic uh, tracks. And definitely like black and brown women and black and brown girls, um, they're just automatically seen as more masculine, um, whether it's true or not, whether they present that way or not, that's just how they're viewed. And so they do get targeted a lot more because they get in trouble, like they get sent to detention, they get suspended or expelled. Um, even if they're doing nothing, like there'll be, I think there was just a, uh, like a study on like the teachers were told that they were doing one thing, but they were, it was really, it was a fake eye tracking test. And the teachers just observed and just basically watched the black kids. And they were like, oh, they're doing something wrong. Oh, they're doing something wrong. Oh, they're doing something wrong. And so it, I'll have to send you that, uh, it was like, just came out this week. And I mean, uh, there's robust evidence that yeah. Uh, black kids are policed more stringently and given harsher punishments for the same infractions as white kids. So totally. And I think like that connection between uh, like just automatically seeing more masculinity and definitely more of like what we've now started labeling like toxic masculinity, like aggression just automatically um, from black and brown women. Uh, I definitely think it's pretty obvious that um especially by high school like all boys especially if they're just like those stereotypical uh, I don't want to say stereotypical but uh traditional uh representations of masculinity like they are people are just kind of programmed to be like oh he he cares about these two or three things oh he's gonna be a troublemaker oh him and like if he has friends then they're all gonna be rowdy and I I mean I know that like growing up I new to just like I didn't really have anything to vibe with the only straight boys that I was really friends with were like the like good little church boys that were also good at school which I think as much as I'm not a fan of religion uh the community that church provides is so important and so like if you have a non-religious family and you just don't have that stability even if it's just like connected to other churches and just kind of that familiarity to talk to people uh, which might be very much like an Alabama Bible Belt thing. Maybe it's not the same everywhere, but definitely like that lack of community, which you, whether you're getting it from sports, you're getting it from your church, you're getting it from literally wherever you can possibly get it. I do think that like that starts to manifest, like even the teachers can see who the loners are, the teachers can, and just kind of like that energy that radiates. Because one thing I like, I personally believe about masculinity is like 
controlling your energy because we just project it like whether we know whether we have a control over it or not we just project ourselves into a room and rather and if you don't have like the experience of interacting with other people knowing how to make that energy supportive knowing how to make it um like even if the people just can't sense that like this is going to be a good conversation or this is this is an interaction that I really want to have today um by high school and like middle school it's still like I tend to believe that all middle schoolers are just rowdy and like you can help anybody by middle school but by high school you're pretty ingrained and short of like a really good teacher like making a uh intervention you, you, you've already decided if you're going to be jaded or not, or if you're gonna like interact and try and grow and like kind of that constant self-improvement is something that like, I mean, we have, it goes all the way back to, to use a very stereotypical reference, like Marcus Aurelius, the whole book of meditations is just about, you have to keep improving. You can never believe that whatever you are is enough. You need to learn more. You need to do more. Uh, you need to help more. You need to contribute more. And so I think there's a lot of, and then a lot of the anxiety and a lot of the like, like the chip on the shoulder is like, no one, like society's not giving me anything. Society's not doing anything for me. Like it's doing it for other people, but they don't take into account like how much those people are participating, how much people are contributing. And whether it's at school, like I was saying, or church or on a team or uh wherever you find your interest to take place like if you're because I know like I was on Goodreads and I had a little writing group on Goodreads like the first year or two I was in Alabama because being a new obviously gay boy in the middle like in Prattville Alabama which is like quoted in Axios as like some of the most conservative places in America like I had to find friends somewhere else and luckily like Goodreads and Tumblr existed but even then we had like people coming from 4chan and reddit to like shut down the site so it was literally like the the queers and the girls online being like we couldn't even escape like the harassment and the um which on some level i think that they thought they were playing around and they just don't they just don't know lines they don't know uh boundaries and we we all suffer for it unfortunately yeah i'm wondering about i think that to a certain extent, something like school is going to be somewhat incompatible with certain aspects of masculinity. Um, you know, your point about energy. Um, I feel like uh, it's often a more masculine manifestation of energy to be loud, to move your body, to want to affect physical change. Um, to be, uh, you know, possibly like talking over people, things like that. And I think that to be competitive and some of those things I think can be very um, uh, compatible with, with uh, education and learning. Um, but some of them I think are just really not compatible with at least the way that we do education now, where it's a lecture model, where it's hours and hours of sitting still, where it's, um, you know, a lot of deference to authority where it's not primarily a competitive situation. Um, and so I'm wondering whether you think that there are some common sense, easy to implement changes in the way we do K through 12 that could um, correct perhaps this disadvantage that, you know, let's say the average boy is at in an academic environment. Um. I definitely think we have to stop just like talk, especially I think in because de down south you definitely know that we don't track but we track for the gods like you got your AP kids you got your honors kids you got your general kids and if you're not an AP they 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 have like given up on you already like honors if you get to college that's great like if you succeed at something like snaps for you but they don't really care like the the money and the success is all put into like that, that ap model those ap kids that they know are gonna uh just kind of go for it on their own like they kind of already have built in that competition and so then that's all yeah, i just i just want to like <clears throat> reiterate what you're saying like i 
was in a lot of regular classes in public school in Alabama um, because I was lazy and didn't see the point of working harder. I'm like, I'm going to college either way. Um, and literally boys mostly would get up in the middle of class while the teacher is trying to instruct and dance like around the room. Um, and it was just, and we had coaches uh, who would be our instructors, um, who would literally just read from the textbook. Um, we had textbooks that didn't have the first 50 pages. They'd been ripped off and they were just using them year after year. I mean, the level of neglect for average students in public schools in much of America is, it, 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 I think it would really boggle a lot of people's minds. So just wanna, mm -hmm. just wanna reiterate your point there. You know, it just, it reinforces to those kids what they already feel. Uh, and like, on like you have the kids who are just like, I mean, this is great. Like the teacher doesn't care. Like I, I like ran out of electives to take at one point. So I started taking like psychology, sociology, which were like general electives. And I was just like, it was just culture shock. Like, and I've moved all over being a military kid, moved continents, moved to different states all the time. And that was probably one of the biggest culture shocks, which is going from like one hallway to another hallway. And they, and it's that segregated other than like when you take health class in 10th grade and they have to funnel everyone in there and then you go back to your perspective zones. And so like that, that communicates to kids that like, we've are we already know where you're at. We already know, like, like I said, it's that the energy that's being radiated and rather than like the kids that dance or the kids that would just start like rapping in the middle of class or if they would something people would just start breaking out into song in the middle of class there has to be a way like we have like one of my best learning experiences through all like k through 12 through college was in grad school when the teacher came in and all of us were talking about something that was going on like in the world like and how it applied and she was just like kind of like sat there and listened to us for two minutes and she was like okay okay hold on and then she completely threw the lesson out and like took what we were already talking about took what was like going on in the world and actually applied it and made it like this fun discussion and like where or the energy already was and so rather being like I did this lesson plan we're gonna do these things which obviously I'm not trying to tell teachers how to do their job like they have ridiculous constraints and expectations and no resources to do it but there are definitely folks who and they get put in classes that they see as low effort and they put in even less effort than is kind of expected of them and we need like we have to get kids excited about learning because then we can't be surprised especially with boys and when they become men who are kind of like problematic or they're not doing uh they're just not contributing in the way to society that we need like our like our current labor shortage like there's every time I hear it I'm just like gentlemen I need you to get off I just they just left I need you to get off twitch and I need you to go build some stuff <laughs> yeah well but I, I think this goes back to k through 12 where it's like essentially it spits out two kinds of kids the kids who are going to college and the kids who are not and the kids who are not do not graduate with any qualifications to do any labor that they didn't have before they started high school mm -hmm. um you know at 16 you're allowed to work at mcdonald's and when you graduate at 18 you're the same level of employability and um you know, it's like, okay, we have all these occupational licenses for um, construction jobs and the skilled trades, um, which, you know, I, I definitely think we need to streamline those um, licensure requirements. But it's like, well, you have these kids captive for six, you know, hours a day. Why not graduate the kids who are not going to college with a certification? Mm -hmm. Why not ensure that they've had an apprenticeship before they graduate? Why not ensure that there's something that they are qualified to do when they get done so that they're not then having to go into debt? They're not then having to figure out because it's a lot of a lot of just bureaucracy. Like, how do I get the certification? What's the test that I take? And it's like rather than teaching them the Pythagorean theorem or whatever, you know, and like they don't know it when they're done anyway. It's like, let's get them in shop and in under a car and, you know, making a, a structure. And so I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity 
And if we want to brand it as like masculinizing K through 12 to make the, you know, manosphere happy, like that's fine with me. But, um, you know, I do think that there is something to be said about, and I, I love what you brought up about looking at who succeeds in school. And it does further the fact that gay men are having an easier time, but lesbian women aren't does, I think, speak to this idea that there is something at odds between masculinity, at least as currently uh, seen and an educational attainment. Um, you know, there, there's a disconnect there. So I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to wrap up. I wanted to give you a chance to give me any last thoughts that you wanted to get across and then uh, tell people more about where to find more of your brilliant thoughts. Yeah, thank you uh, again. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that my any final thoughts would just be that like, I, again, this all it, like not to be like super queer about it, but we love binaries <laughs> in uh, America. And I think there's a lot of people who like you are either doing toxic masculinity or you're doing like good masculinity. And we, we like, just like feminism allowed, like women can be anything they want. There's so many different kinds of women. Uh, we really need uh, an ongoing conversation like you're doing and just with everybody else to kind of like start contributing to it, but especially like men to be involved in it. And like, what are the different kinds of masculinity? Like we have soft by boy masculinity that's super popular right now. And like, everybody wants one. Um, what is, um, like you got positive masculinity, like you got a Mr. Rogers out here, like make being those kinds of things. And then just, you don't have to toss masculinity away in order to leave the parts of it, like the uh, aggression, the dominance, the misogyny, like you can throw all of that out and still be a man in every way, shape and form. And honestly, that's what people want from you, especially straight women. And there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of men who are under the impression that uh, they have to be one thing. I know like they talk about alphas all the time. And it's, I, for me, like being the fantasy sci-fi nerd that I am, like I just find that to be like a complete misunderstanding because they're like, you gotta be a Chad, you gotta, you gotta be out there and look a certain way. And if you don't, like they've been internalized um, so many bad messages, so many bad um, communications where it's like, no, like get on Twitter and re read the threads where they're like, I want a man with a gut. I want my soft by boy who will watch trashy girly TV with me. Like there is like, there's 4 billion women and 4 billion men on this planet. Like you don't have to be one specific type of like guy that gets casted on fuckboy island. Like you don't have to have this perfect body and, but then also be kind of dumb so that people think that's cute and humorous. Like, find whatever is you and find how you can be that person and build other people up. Because I firmly believe, although I know people are like, men have been at the center of society. No, like we like, look at, look at the military. Like we are sandbags. Like we are expendable sandbags and we are meant to support. We are meant to go out and accomplish things and accomplish things for our family, our friends, our society, uh, we're meant to protect ourselves and protect other people, but not so much that you're like overstepping. It's more of we, am, an ideal man to me is someone who goes out and leave and helps and supports and protects, but leaves enough space so that that person you're helping or those people that you're helping understand when you're gone, that like they are their own first line of help and support and protection and just imbuing people with that sense of security when you're there in their presence and when they think about you. So when they can, they can like cut, pull that into their own lives. And I think at the moment people are really focused on like being that leader, but they always forget the part where like the leader is supposed to feel everybody's pain. The leader is supposed to care about if in one person drops, you failed as a leader. It's not about being Donald Trump or with that type of person who's just chauvinistic and kind of putting on displays of power and strength and any and status, good Lord. It's really about how are you helping the women in your life? How are you helping the other men in your life? Are you telling people you love them? Are you telling people you miss them? And are you telling people you're there for them? And at the end of the day, right now, we're not doing that, but I really think, um, 
conversations like this one. And uh, honestly, the growing prevalence of those soft bi boys that I was talking about uh, gives me a little bit of hope for the future and just kind of giving men more options because right now they feel like if they're not an athlete and they're not the gay boy succeeding at school that they might as well go try and get a job at that furniture store or waste away in their house. And you're a man, you need to be outside to get, like your testosterone goes up when you're in the sun, go outside. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think masculinity should be a, a positive force. It should be a guide. It shouldn't be a prison. It shouldn't be limiting. And yeah, I would say this has really helped me clarify. I think my message to native born US men, especially young men, is you are not extra. You are necessary. You know, we need you. We need what you have to offer. And that's including and especially if it falls outside of whatever you've been told masculinity is. Um, okay, where can people find you? Yeah, so you can find me at a Third Culture um, Substack. It's a newsletter about how queer people fit into diplomacy, politics, and war. Uh, I really try to bring uh, attention to what's going on with queer people all around the world because it's not just Obergefell happened and everything's fine. We have a lot of backlash going. We have a lot of progress going at the same time. You know, it's being a queer person. It's always it's an ongoing conversation, ongoing dynamic all around the world. And then on basically any other social media, if you look up KG Borland, you're going to find me. And uh, KGBorland.com has all my published writings uh, listed there. Probably need to update a little bit. Um, but just has any, all the links to where you can find me. Fantastic. I can't recommend Kyle's writing enough, especially if you're interested in the topics he's covering. He's an excellent writer, um, excellent social media presence and a wonderful friend. So thank you so much for your time. It was so great to catch up and, um, I'd love to have you on again. Let me know if you have any more thoughts about things you want to cover. Um, and I will talk to you soon. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too.